Hello there, I'm James Parton, author of Life and Times of Benjamin Franklin, Life of Thomas Jefferson, and several other biographies of influential modern men. Today, I'd like to tell you about one of my most fascinating subjects, Andrew Jackson, the president whose ruthless politics and iron will earned him the nickname King Andrew I. To really understand Andrew Jackson, one must start with his remarkable and tragic youth. Born to poor farmers in 1767 in the backwoods Waxhaws region of the Carolinas, he grew into adolescence during the height of the Revolutionary War. He joined the Continental Army as a courier, but his entire immediate family died during or shortly after the war. This helped turn Jackson into the vengeful, violent, and driven man who would one day fight his way to the highest office in the country. After several years of wandering, gambling, and fighting, Jackson began his path to notoriety as a lawyer in Salisbury, North Carolina. He quickly shed his common upbringing and joined the upper echelons of society. He retained his wildness and short temper, however. Once, as a joke, he invited the town's notorious prostitutes to a Christmas ball intended for the nobility, to the horror of the proper gentlemen and ladies. After a move to Tennessee, he began his political career, serving as the state's first representative, then holding several offices before becoming commander of the state's militia. It was during these years that he began a long and illustrious dueling career, challenging anyone who insulted his or his wife's honor. During one of his dozens of duels, he faced Charles Dickinson, reputed as the best shot in Tennessee. Jackson turned and stood with his gun drawn as Dickinson aimed and fired the first shot, missing Jackson's heart by half an inch. Jackson then slowly and deliberately aimed and shot Dickinson dead. To reiterate, when standing a few paces away from a man very intent on killing him with a loaded gun, Jackson politely allowed his opponent to shoot first, and still won. He gained renown among the common people during his very successful military career, in which he defended New Orleans from a British invasion force in the War of 1812. The war had officially ended several days before the Battle of the Spot, but that certainly didn't keep Jackson from gleefully slaughtering some British people. He gained so much popularity as a general that he decided the time was right to run for president in 1824, casting himself as a man of the people to appeal to the newly enfranchised working class voters. He won the most electoral votes, but the election was so close that it went to the House of Representatives, who declared John Quincy Adams the victor. Jackson denounced this as a corrupt bargain and vowed to run again, winning the 1828 election and beginning his eight-year reign. His first act in office? As tradition dictated, he hosted a post-inauguration party at the White House, but unlike his predecessors, it looked less like this. And more like this. To the break of dawn, yo! Once the thousands of riotous commoners had been dispersed and the damage was repaired, Jackson got down to the business of amassing as much power as he could and completely ignoring the other branches of government. He immediately dismissed about a fifth of federal employees and replaced them with party loyalists, which was called the spoils system by his opponents. He used the power of veto more times than every president before him combined. His most famous veto was a veto of the Recharter Bill for the Second Bank of the United States, which was used to control the money supply and store federal funds, in spite of overwhelming support from the legislature. Although in the short term, Jackson became the only president to ever fully repay the national debt, the bank war led to the Panic of 1837, a severe depression that lasted nearly a decade. Even still, a president with astoundingly bad fiscal policy and hatred of paper money ended up on the $20 bill. Around this time, Jackson was the target of the first assassination attempt on his sitting United States president. A man named Richard Lawrence, who believed he was King Richard III of England, attempted to kill Jackson while he was attending a funeral in order to secure his ascension to the English throne. In spite of his best efforts to outcrazy Jackson, both of his pistols misfired and Jackson jumped on Lawrence, beating him mercilessly with his cane until he was pulled off of him by his aides. One of the most telling moments of Jackson's presidency was the nullification crisis of 1828 to 1832. It began when South Carolina opposed what they saw as an unreasonably high tax on imported manufactured goods, on which they were reliant. Lesser men might have tried to broker a compromise, but not Jackson. Taking this as an affront to his authority, he urged Congress to pass a so-called force bill. 
This would have authorized the army and navy to collect taxes essentially at gunpoint. The image of a police state patrolled by military tax collectors is certainly at odds with the limited, pro-states rights government Jackson and his followers claimed to support. It was actually his mortal enemy, Henry Clay, who managed to broker a compromise and prevent civil war. Jackson's complete disregard for democracy and the balance of power in the government didn't stop there. Although previous presidents had spoken of relocating the Indians since the first days of Washington, Jackson was a man of action. In 1830, he signed into law the Indian Removal Act, which mandated the forced removal of five major tribes from their homes in the American South to the barren Indian Territory west of the Mississippi. One tribe, the Cherokee, actually won a Supreme Court case that ruled that they had a right to their lands, but Jackson wouldn't let due process or justice get in the way of progress, and said that Chief Justice Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Jackson proceeded to authorize the removal anyway, which came to be known as the Trail of Tears, on which thousands of Indians died. Thankfully for civilized people like me, this opened up huge tracts of fertile land for settling and development. Great men of history are often measured by the profound words of wisdom they leave behind. Jackson, as he reflected on his life's works, said that he had but two regrets, that he had been unable to shoot Henry Clay or to hang John C. Calhoun. John C. Calhoun, by the way, was Jackson's vice president, and in case you don't think he was being serious, at one point during the nullification crisis, he had actually threatened to hang him from the first tree he could find. A polarizing figure with a life full of contradictions, Andrew Jackson's legacy is complex and evolving. However, in spite of the achievements of his movement, it cannot be said that he himself was a champion of democracy. His politics were ruthless and uncompromising, he defied the legislature in order to realize his economic schemes, and ignored a Supreme Court decision in order to violate the natural rights of Native Americans and remove them forcibly from their lands. As I once described him, Jackson was a democratic autocrat, an urbane savage, an atrocious saint. However, regardless of his decidedly undemocratic tactics, Andrew Jackson's presidency left an indelible mark on the history of America that remains today. Andrew Jackson's presidency left an indelible mark on the history of America that remains today. I've been your host, James Parton, and I'd like to thank my producer, Zach Kaplan, and all the great men of history who came before me. Thanks for joining us, and have a good night, America.